begin with a look back at the JFK presidency, a time of expectation and hope. The devotion which we bring to this endeavor will light our country and all who serve it. John Candy knew how to reach the people and excite them with hope. He established a new style and tone for the presidency, one that evoked national pride. In the eyes of many Americans, he remains the nation's most admired president. Kennedy's ratings plunged after less than three months in office when he displayed weakness and indecision in the Bay of Pigs invasion by refusing to provide military support to Cuban refugees, attempting to overthrow Fidel Castro. Kennedy agonized over it for some time. It shall be the policy of this nation to regard any nuclear missile launched from Cuba against any nation in the Western Hemisphere as an attack by the Soviet Union on the United States, requiring a full retaliatory response upon the Soviet Union. Soviet leader Nikita Khrushchev got the message and backed down, packing up the missiles and shipping them out of Cuba. But Kennedy felt the threat of nuclear war would still loom as long as both superpowers maintained large nuclear arsenals. The weapons of war must be abolished before they abolish us. While Kennedy was smothering the flames of crisis in some parts of the world, a fire of conflict was just flickering in South Vietnam. Kennedy sent in 16,000 U.S. military advisors. Members of his inner circle say, had JFK lived, he would have backed away from that war. At home, Kennedy's greatest challenge was dealing with the nation's racial conflict. This nation, for all its hopes and all its boasts, will not be fully free until all its citizens are free. Critics suggest Kennedy didn't want to make political enemies in the South and was actually waiting for re-election in 1964 before pushing his civil rights legislation. It passed shortly after his murder. And so, my fellow Americans, ask not what your country can do for you, ask what you can do for your country. John F. Kennedy. This morning we talk about his legacy and we're delighted to have with us in the studio today Robert Himmelberg, a professor of history at uh, Fordham University who specializes in 20th century political and economic history. Professor Tom Halper is chairman of the political science department at Baruch College and the author of several books including Foreign Policy Crises in which he writes about JFK and the Bay of Pigs invasion and the Cuban Missile Crisis. Gentlemen, thank you so much for coming in. Let's get right to it. How has the test of time treated John F. Kennedy? Well, shall I go? Uh, <laughs> fine. Uh, I think if you look at the intangibles, I think that uh, Kennedy is always rated very highly. Uh, he presented this uh, appearance of a great vigor. Uh, Schlesinger called him a presidency of youth in contrast to Eisenhower, who presumably was a, a represented the presidency of old age. So he had this great appearance of vigor. We know now, of course, that much of this appearance was really uh, undermined by reality. He was in many ways a sick man. He had uh, uh, Addison's disease. He had terrible back problems. But much of what Kennedy had to offer in the long run, I think, has been this, this great appearance the appearance of, of vigor, uh, I would even say the appearance of, of triumph more perhaps than, than really the substance of triumph. But it is this great appearance that, that I think has remained his, his great legacy. And thanks to television and, and, and virtually a, a kind of industry that's grown up around Kennedy, I, I think that it has endured very well, and I, and I think the prospects are very good. Professor Hemelberg? I think all that's true. Uh, to put it a little differently, I think uh, one could say he established a kind of model for the presidency, uh, which has uh, been followed by, I would say, the only successful, memorably successful president since him, um, Reagan, Clinton, frankly, are the only two really successful presidents since. And in many ways, I think you can draw parallels between Kennedy and them. He was dramatic. Um, he was a, he knew how to be both a celebrity and how to govern. He was pragmatic. I mean, I could go on at length describing characteristics that would apply to him and I think would apply to Clinton too. Pragmatic in the sense that he is a neoliberal. He, 
he kind of developed the neoliberal style, I think, of governing, meaning getting away from New Deal liberalism toward a new, more pragmatic, problem-solving, non-ideological, not so much wedded to the big interest groups that the New Deal had been wedded to, like uh, labor unions and that kind of thing. Critics, critics argue that he was only a fair president, but a very good politician. Do you agree with that assessment? Uh, I, I don't think that's adequate myself. Uh, fair president, I mean, the definition is, uh, is uh, it would be hard to arrive at a definition we can all agree on, is what is a great president and so on. As I said, uh, his accomplishment was relatively minor, all right, in terms of great legislation and that kind of thing, yes. But uh, you could argue that those crises were quite real, not manufactured, and he did he did surmount them. I don't know what you say about that. The greatest crisis was what you wrote about, about yeah. the uh, Bay of Pigs when, and uh, when, the Cuban when, Missile Crisis. When, when you call him a, a fair, when you say that critics call him a fair president but a great politician, I, I would say he was a fair president. Uh, he really didn't have many successes. Probably his only important legislative success was a tax cut. Mm -hmm. And tax cuts are not that difficult to achieve. People don't like to pay taxes. Uh, civil rights and so on, he really had not accomplished those kinds of things. A great politician. I would say he really was not a great politician. You needed a great politician like Lyndon Johnson who followed him and who benefited from all of the mourning and grief that, that followed on Kennedy's murder yeah. in order to get the legislative program passed. So I would say he was a fair, a fair president, he was a fair politician, but he was a, a master of appearance. And he was helped to some extent, I think, by that age. In the, he was a president of the television age. He was the president of, a televi of the television age, but the television age almost in its infancy, where it had not become aggressively investigative the way it is today. I don't know how he, for example, uh, nowadays we all have heard about his sexual escapades. In those days, it was uh, an iron law that the media did not touch this. Well, nowadays we know that it's very different. Yeah. So he was, he was a man of his time, and I think that that helped him enormously. Well, yes, but that's all true. The usual argument there for the, his defenders who would make him a great president, and there's a whole school of thought that would argue that he was a great president, you know, in the sense of accomplishment. It would be, uh, I think, in setting the precedence, especially toward the end, uh, there's a great deal of emphasis in friendly circles, that is, those who write in a friendly way or an agitatory way about him. But in his last year, he was turning in a direction that uh, future presidents would turn in, uh, toward uh, detente, for example, after he laid the basis for detente. Uh, with that famous speech uh, in June, I think, an American University speech where he, he spoke in terms of the possibility of, of ending the Cold War, the possibility of cooperation and negotiation of subtle issues rather than simply strength, you know, simply military strength. Uh, his submission of a, a real civil rights bill late, very late in his life, that kind of thing. And it's true that Johnson, the politician, uh, was able to capitalize on Kennedy's death and the mourning and all that to get that stuff through. And that he twisted a lot of arms, and he was able to deal with the South better than Kennedy was. And Kennedy was timid about dealing with the South. It's true with Southern political so that power. Civil rights legislation it's, is part of the uh, LBJ's legacy, well, of JFK's. Well, JFK presented it after right. all. I mean, on the and other Johnson hand, Johnson the one who got Johnson it through. Johnson got it through. Well, <laughs> but we, but I think his Kennedy's admirers do have a point in that we don't know <laughs> what the second term would have looked like. I want to talk about that. Let's pursue that. We'd have to take a break. What would have happened had Kennedy gone on to a second term? Would we have gone into Vietnam? Some of his inside staff said no. Mm -hmm. We'll find out what our political experts have to say. Yeah, right. well, 11 News Close Up continues. Stay with us. Welcome back. This morning we're talking about the JFK legend. John F. Kennedy certainly knew how to reach the people and excite them with hope. Back in 1960, he established a new style and tone for the presidency, one that evoked national pride. Don't let it be forgot that once there was a spot for one brief shining moment. Camelot. 
John Kennedy's favorite lines from the musical about King Arthur's court, words that embody a brief shining moment in the American presidency, when a young dynamic leader with a beautiful family inspired us all. His good looks and magnetism played well for the cameras. He was the first president to hold live news conferences, 64 of them, and there was no question he couldn't handle with ease. Would you say with a couple of hard words tonight and explain what the band-aid is doing on your right hand? <laughs> uh, I cut my finger when I was cutting bread. Unbelievable as it may uh, sound. It reminded me of the time when President Kennedy got a degree from Yale and he said he had the best of all worlds. A hard education and a Yale degree. Although his private life has been sensationalized in the media, it's JFK's public image that endures. Don't let it be forgot that once there was a spot for one brief shining moment. 1,000 days in the White House this weekend, the 45th anniversary of his assassination. We're with Professor Robert Himmelberg of uh, Fordham University, Professor Tom Halper, the uh, chairman of the political science department at Peru College, talking about the Kennedy legacy. In the first segment, you were talking about his imagery, the vigor, the youthfulness in the White House that was more outstanding than any of his accomplishments during the day. Is that is that the lasting image you see of John F. Kennedy? As historians I, will view it? Well, I certainly see the image, as I was saying, I think the image and the model is one that has been followed. I think it's a mistake to downgrade the accomplishment too much. Uh, another tack I could take, I was talking about how, you know, we don't know what would the result would have been had he lived. But aside from that, aside, he developed, I think, a certain policy style also, as well as a personal style a pragmatic, democratic style, which in fact has been pursued uh, by the more successful democratic politicians of uh, the last 40 or 50 years. If you point to the ones who have been successful, I think they have followed the same kind of pragmatic approach to problem solving. The belief in mo what some call modernization, that growth will conquer everything and so forth. That within the American consensus, as it were, uh, around the vital center, the expression that used to be used, it is possible to um, um, solve all problems. In other words, whether it's racism or, or poverty or whatnot, that it could be solved primarily through stimulating growth, through education, through bringing people out of the culture of poverty, that kind of thing. Let, let's pursue, let, let's hypothesize here. What, how would history have been different had Kennedy gone on to a second term? Well, that, of course, is the $64 question. <laughs> uh, and, and I think one can say that the, the acolytes have uh, uh, extrapolated all in a, in a good direction and the critics in a, in a bad direction. We, we really don't know. Uh, if, we, if we look at civil rights, for example, uh, he had talked about civil rights, and then uh, he really wanted to see if he could retain the South for 1964 when he had to call the troops out in Alabama and Mississippi. It became obvious he wouldn't. And so he began to move uh, in civil rights, but uh, not very effectively. He had appointed many segregationist judges. So what would he have done there? I, I don't know. I, I think that verbally he, he would have done some important things, but maybe only verbally. What would he done? What would he have done in Vietnam? I, I think that that the uh, uh, the indications are, I would say, that that he would he would have continued down the road. And it seems to me that I think the, there's good reason to think he would have. I, he I, was so deeply administration was so deeply implicated in the downfall of DM. We had responsibility for that. You're taking responsibility for the government for the future, that kind there of thing. There were some insiders who suggested that if he had gone to a second term, he would not have committed more troops. Or he would well, not have gotten deeper but in the There's no. Uh, look, lots and lots of historians, and I suppose political scientists, have looked at that issue, and there's no proof one way or the other. It's, you the, can't the, find any contemporary. The, the people evidence. he appointed, people like McNamara and Rusk, were, were really the people who were... And Bundy. Uh, and Bundy. The, Bundy for Kelly's These sake. were the people who were... He was uh, a gung-ho Vietnam. Absolutely. People. So it wasn't as if this was forced upon well, I, I repeat, the DM, this seems to be, for, sometimes it's forgotten, no. that we actually, 
we toppled the DM government or gave the, 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 the go ahead for it so another group could take it because he wasn't following the policies we wanted followed. He wasn't doing a well, good let's, job let's, and so let's on. talk about the Kennedy legacy and uh, Caroline Kennedy had done an ad for Barack Obama linking him to the Kennedy legacy. Do you see the parallel? Oh, she, she appeared with him with Kennedy. Yes, and, and so yeah, endorsed, absolutely endorsed him. Do you mm. see a parallel? I think the there's an obvious parallel that both are, are uh, young, attractive, uh, full of uh, vigor. They're smart. They're uh, clever. They're witty. They're cool. Uh, they have attractive <laughs> families. They're cool. They have a lot of things in common. I, I, I think that that's a, it's an obvious parallel. I think some of characterizing what we're about to see is Camelot, too. Would you go that far? Well, I, I don't know whether we'll see it in policy or not. The, uh, the right during the, camp, during the campaign uh, was fond of trying to show that Obama was the most left-leaning senator in the Senate and that kind of thing. I suspect we're going to find that he's going to govern in the Kennedy style, that is, towards the center, rely upon pragmatic policies and solutions, and uh, we'll probably even wind up cutting taxes so as to stimulate growth <laughs> like you Kennedy agree? Do you did. see Obama going towards uh, more towards the center? I, I, I believe that Obama is going to do some significant things early. I, I think that unlike Kennedy, Obama is really facing a very, very tough situation. Uh, the country really is in serious shape. This was not true in 1960 when Kennedy took over. That's the true. chief problem, according to Kennedy, was this missile gap with the Soviets, and when he took over, he found out that it didn't exist. So we were in pretty good shape in 1960, but today we're not, and I believe that... Yeah. that uh, but but, but let, let me say this. I'm sorry to interrupt. Go ahead. There's the... Uh, uh, yes, I think he was, he's coming in with a mandate, I think, something of a mandate, more like FDR in 33, in a way, in that he won the election by a large margin. He's got control of both houses and so forth. But what was he going to do? When we started off, we were going to push through uh, a health plan and that kind of thing, you know. Now, as you say, the country's in terrible shape, and we're going to be, we're going to be trying to revive the economy. And Kennedy I, faced I, the I, Bay of Pigs, and uh, Obama faces the economic crisis. As a matter of fact, is, Kennedy actually, by his own testimony, was facing a sluggish economy and that kind of thing. Get America going again, and so forth. That was the theme song of the first year, actually, the tax cut of the first year, and so on. I want on. to continue exploring the Kennedy legacy, but first we have to take a break. Stay with us. We'll be right back. Welcome back. We're with Professor Robert Himmelberg and Professor Tom Halper talking about the Kennedy legacy on the 45th anniversary of his assassination as of yesterday. Um, we're talking about Barack Obama and his style and his technique and his approach to the White House. And you believe that we're going to be seeing a bit of a Kennedy-esque style and policy at the, at the White House come January 20th? Absolutely. I, and I think it's no accident. It, it may partly be because that's the kind of person Obama is, that he is this cool, reserved, uh, witty, clever, attractive person. But I think it's also to probably to some extent consciously modeling himself after this. Uh, but I, I think that uh, Kennedy has come up with a very, uh, or key, Kennedy came up with a very effective model. And I, I agree with Bob that uh, a lot of successful people have copied that. You, uh, a way to put it is that Kennedy <coughs> combined celebrity, being a celebrity with governing, <laughs> with a new style. He was the first American president, I think, who was a genuine celebrity. Uh, FDR was popular, Teddy Roosevelt was popular, Woodrow Wilson was popular, that kind of thing, but not in the way that, Teddy, that uh, JFK was popular. He was popular in the same way that a movie star is popular. He was the rock star so of the 60s, and Obama's the rock star. We, wanted, we could take it to that extent, I guess. <laughs> but in any case, when you think of the young Kennedy coming into the White House in 1960, who do you think of? You think of a blending of Jimmy Stewart, Cary Grant, and uh, Henry Fonda, and so forth, you know. Let me and he, this is the kind of style that he let had. Me, let me digress from our trip down, uh, looking back at history for a moment, and ask about uh, Obama. And uh, the, the, the word out there is that uh, Senator Hillary Clinton will be uh, named as his Secretary of State. That's the expectations. This, this, this calls to mind uh, the remark of that great political philosopher, Don Corleone, <laughs> uh, who was reported to have said, uh, Keep your friends close and your enemies closer. <laughs> and uh, I think it, it may have been, uh, the move may have been done with, with that in mind. 
it it obviously is a further olive branch to to uh, Hillary supporters. It's it sets Very the important. Democrats up for 16 years because secretaries of state in the early days of the Republic always inherit, inherited the presidency. You know, Jefferson and Madison and Monroe and so forth. And uh, they're, they're, they're beginning a new, he's beginning a new democratic dynasty. So you're saying it's a good political move. What yes, about political move. as far as for the administration as her, she as, as Secretary of she's, State? She's you know, there, there, there always is a, a, a kind of a duking out among the major players, uh, the Secretary of Defense, the Secretary of State, uh, the head of the National Security Council, the, the chief uh, defense uh, advisor. Uh, there, there always is this. Very often you find somebody whose name you didn't even know it turns out to be more important. Now, Hillary's tough. She can hold up her end, however, and she has the, as it were, persona and the clout and the support of the people enough that she's a heavyweight as far as dealing one-on-one -on -one with the big foreign potentates is concerned. I, how, how, whether she's, you know, really that great at foreign affairs is beside the point. She has an entourage to take care of that. It's how you can, whether you have the proper gravitas, I think, and, and she does have it. This morning we're talking about John F. Kennedy, uh, who was assassinated 45 years ago yesterday. And I want to talk for a moment about the Warren Commission, which was impaneled to investigate the assassination, concluded that a lone gunman, Lee Harvey Oswald, killed President Kennedy. Yet 45 years later, conspiracy theorists are not convinced. They insist JFK's death was the result of a conspiracy involving multiple gunmen. The primary evidence for the Warren Commission's findings and the very fuel for the conspiracy theorist is a 26 second film clip taken by Dallas dress manufacturer Abraham Zapruder. During a radio interview with him in 1967, he described to me just what he saw through the viewfinder of his camera that fateful day. Five years ago, the sixth floor museum at uh, Dealey Plaza permitted me to add his voice to that historic, but I must warn you, very graphic clip of film. I saw the motorcycles, then the car approached, and uh, Jacqueline and the president were waving, and as it came in line with my camera, I heard a shot. I saw the president lean over to Jacqueline, then the second shot came, and then I realized I saw his head open up, and I started yelling, they killed him, they killed him, and I continued shooting until he went under the underpass. It's uh, left in my mind like a wound that heals up, but yet there's some pain left as to what has happened. Imagery seared in all of our minds even 45 years later. Your thoughts 45 years later, Professor? It still saddens me to see it. Um, as far uh, it was a great shock to us. <clears throat> uh, as far as the assassination theories are concerned, uh, there's been a ocean full of ink spilled and so forth, and uh, every rational, careful analysis has been done shows there's no basis to it. Tom? It was very, very shocking. It was it was almost as shocking as 9-11. It was one of those things that I never imagined would happen, and then it did, and it just shakes your faith in, in everything. Professor Thomas Himmelberg, Professor of History, Fordham University, Professor Tom Halper from Baruch College, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you. And that'll do it for our program for this week. If you have any comments or wish to see this broadcast again, please log on to our website at WPIX.com slash News Close Up. I'm Marvin Scott. Thanks so much for joining us. Enjoy the rest of your Sunday, everyone.